So with this, I want to now slowly start going into the text, but the way I want to do it is to, you know, first identify some concepts. This is, I'm just, this is experimental. Um, and then just talk about the concept. So first he starts by saying that let's try to identify the first principles. This is very much Aristotelian, okay? The one point that he makes very early is when you're looking at art, you have to look at three things, the medium, the object, and the manner. Okay, so medium is how how the art is being carried out. So there is a medium of a play, there's a medium of poetry being recited, there is a medium of uh, written work. Uh, there is, you can look at the medium as musical sounds, you can look at you know, medium as visual arts. So there is a medium that you're using. There is the object, you're trying to portray something. That's the goal towards which you're trying to go. And then there is a manner or a style in which it is being, being portrayed. Um, so that's one observation that he has. The second big observation that he starts with is that of imitation, that art is imitative. You're trying to imitate. So that's again, a very interesting idea and would love to hear what you think about the role of imitation in art. Is art only imitative? Is there something else to it than imitative? So first is this, so first point I want to put on the table is this medium, object, and manner. Second point I want to put in put on the table is that of uh, imitation. Uh, let's see. The next point that we can go to is his characterization of literature. Okay, but I want to just see if you have any thoughts about the role of imitation in art and about this three part three pronged way of analyzing art. So if you have any thoughts about either of these two points, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. We're going to start with Pat. Pat. Is it um, I think the object uh, medium manner area is really, really intelligent. And I see that it's still used generally. I think that his thing about imitation is weak. It's really, really weak. Um, music obviously doesn't imitate anything unless you're talking about music by sang songs where, you know, the orchestra is, you know, tries to imitate the sound of different birds and animals. But that's obviously essentially a novelty piece. So, yes, there's a kind of hyper-realist painting as well. But again, that sort of thrown, that tends to exist on the fringes. The main, the sort of main broad area of, and there's areas of sculpture, which is hyper-realist sculpture. There's a German sculptor who does hyper-realist pieces. I don't know if you've seen them. They're, they're quite creepy, actually, but they're extremely well made. I can't remember his name. Um, but those tend to be on the, on the in the sort of area of art, which is a kind of, within Western culture, considered a kind of, um, circus freak show or wow isn't that crazy that's so realistic but within the main sort of broad area of critical consciousness absolute imitation in art is considered rather tacky and bad taste and it's something for children what's considered more important is evocation of emotion which is something altogether different and it's a much more sophisticated um negotiation with the viewer so i think the imitation one has been dropped more or less by um general critical opinion at least for the time being in in the west excellent excellent point so let's First, talk about imitation, and then we'll talk about the second point, because I think it, each of them is large enough point to be discussed on its own. So uh, if anybody has comments about imitation, um, I I basically agree with what uh, Tad is saying, that I think imitation is one part of art, but if that's all there is, 
and nothing new actually is coming coming up from it and it is actually you're trying to make copies of copies of copies and each time you're getting worse because you're losing the even even when you're trying to just copy things you're you're, you're kind of going going downhill so that well, is well right. i mean the most imitative form probably that people would say was photography where even a, a, you know even a very small child can take a very good photograph which represents somebody perfectly or recognizably even a machine can do it so you could say that's the ultimate imitative art form however that's always been something that photography itself has had a problem struggling with and it's always had to try to assert itself as an artistic expressive medium in the abstract sense that the other art mediums have to sorry i i, I jump in again there i i, I leave the floor that's to everyone great. else that's that's a great great point and i uh, would love to uh look at photog photography because most of the art doesn't focus you know aesthetics doesn't focus most of it has been written before the time of photography so it is really a very good example of seeing what the artistic nature of photographic photography is where does the art come in and all all of that so it's this is great so would love to hear folks just on the topic now of um of imitation uh go ahead uh evanique followed by mona evanique yeah um i i tend to agree with tad on this one uh, imitation by itself is really, um, it's unimaginative if you're just doing it just to imitate someone. I think what Aristotle may have been speaking to is, you know, um, some people say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And sometimes people like inadvertently imitate people they admire their art form their style but then they try to bring their own flair to it their own individuality to it um so i think that that does well i also think in terms of music um you can hear like when a musician makes a, a beat or a sound um a lot of people will take that sound and then bring their own flair to it. You see it all throughout a uh, musical uh, from Beethoven, from Bach, all the way up to like Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, you know, all the, across genres, all across, like people can take it and then they can make it their own and they can even cross genres with it. And I think that's where it becomes interesting because you're bringing your own to it. And a lot of times, Artists will tell you that they don't even realize they've done it until after they've made the music themselves and put their own flair on it, that they realize that they took it from, or they they were imitating, or you know they were taking the music from somewhere else. Um, I think you can see it in literature too. I think you can see where, you know, there are ab adaptations of different plays and such. And, you know, people take, Shakespeare, for instance, and they bring it into the modern world. They bring it to a movie, but they modernize it for 20 or, you know, uh, I think the most modern Shakespeare one came out in like the late 90s. Um, but they did it in like real time, but they used the language because they thought the language was good. But then the Im imagination is that they adapted it to modern times. So I think when you're talking about imitation, if it's done genuinely and not just to copy people uh, just for the sake of copying, I think it's great. And I think, you know, if it if you use it as inspiration, I think that's the key. If it's imitation because it's inspired, you're inspired by the artist, then yes. But when it's not inspired, I think that's where you just, it's just like, eh. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Let's go to Mona. Uh, then Paul, and then we'll go back to Tad. Uh, go ahead, Mona. <laughs> I'm very interested in this topic because I just recently read a passage in a Mary Oliver uh, hand poetry handbook. So she bas she's basically teaching how to write poetry. And she has a chapter just on imitation. And she's basically saying that... Um, you would learn very little in this world if you were not allowed to imitate. And um, 
that that that's something that one needs to do to learn a skill. Um, so it's not just for children, you know, like just learning to 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 write. It's it's a craft, right? You have to learn to do things. So so by imitation, you basically learn how to do it. And she says, uh, if imitation were encouraged, much would be learned and learned well. Um, and now it's learned partially or haphazardly without imitation. Before we can be poets, we must, we must practice. Imitation is a very good way of investigating the real thing. The profits are many, the perils are few. And a student may find it difficult to drop an imitated style if the style is followed for too long, but that's not likely to happen if a person moves from style to style. So eventually they outgrow and grow into themselves. So that's my take on it. I, I really enjoy this. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mona. I mean, this is really, really interesting because you just take the concept of imitation and just run it through the art at every, every level. And lots of interesting points are going to come up. So I'm just glad of just this entire kind of symphony of thoughts here. Uh, next up is going to be Paul followed by Tad. Paul. Yeah, I'm walking. I'll be switching to my other Zoom soon. So Srikant, I'm safe. I didn't kill anyone. Okay. And I agree with you about driving. So um, uh, I want to, I'd have to reread the text, but I'm curious if we should give Aristotle a little more credit here, meaning, okay, the Greeks and the idea of the forms. And then if you made a sort of a sculptor of a triangle, you're trying to imitate the divine form. And just like a symphony or I actually think in terms of music of Schoenberg thinking about the Holocaust. And so he wrote this incredible 12 tone piece, but it's, it's imitating a giant emotional wave. And that's a sense of the word imitation that we might want to consider attributing to Aristotle beyond the, oh, there's a human face. So I make a sculpture of a human face. He might've been a level above that in his thought of what imitation is. It's an imitation of something that's divine and impossible to reproduce, uh, except in our meager art method. Excellent, excellent point, Paul. Thank you. Next up is Tad. Tad, go ahead. Uh, there is an issue about the word imitation being um, almost by definition negative. Um, I think also there's a discussion to be had about what the difference is between imitation and tradition. So. Is the I mean, if you take say uh, something like the Chinese uh, tradition in painting, continuing and sustaining the tradition is considered uh, utterly legitimate and central value, much more than being original. The Western tradition places this huge weight on artists to produce something new. And so they've sort of taken on board the ideas of imitation as being something to be scorned to some degree to be escaped from whereas other other cultures will say well no this is something of value i'm sustaining an essential part of our culture through imitation and i try to advance it with maybe some small inventions pushing here pushing a little bit to the left to the right etc so i think that's an area to talk about which is if tradition, how how um, Aristotle would view tradition, would he view it as being imitation in a negative sense or in a positive sense? Uh, I'm curious. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is this is such a such a great beginning to the discussion on imitation. Um, so I'm I'm going to try to speak about this. This is very very tough topic. Um, so on one hand. Firstly, you have to understand, we have to understand that, you know, all these translations do not do justice to the words, because we take the original word, and then we use the translation of it. By the time you've translated it, the meaning that is attached to it keeps changing. So we are, we are actually reading into it a lot of the meaning that is more recent and that's, so you have to be very careful about saying, okay, what is it that Aristotle is actually saying? So it takes a lot of work 
in and communing with the original language and original text in order to you know figure out exactly what is being said. Um, let me before I continue, I'm going to have uh, Sabrina um, chime in. Sabrina, go ahead. Uh, hello. So I think imitation is actually important um, because when in terms, and I'm going to speak now to, to uh, painting specifically, right? In the masters did it one copy from the other one because you start to learn te techniques, right? Styles and the different concepts. And, and it's sort of like a roadmap uh, almost like a template, right? That that you're using, um, and and then you can take off from there, um, and see where do, where do you want to take this now? So so it's sort of like a balance of a using something that inspires you, so that you can now put your own unique expression in into into the piece. Um, and, and then the other thing is you can take, uh, somebody else's work and almost do like a satire of it. Right. And, and, and sort of, and take it in a completely different direction of why you saw it this way. Right. What almost like a critique, a satire of, of the piece. So we can, um, an imitation doesn't necessarily mean right. You you don't want to copy it exactly, um, but you, even when you copy it exactly, if you're just learning, right, um, it it starts to show you right. It's it's sort of like that, not looking at a blank canvas kind of thing, um, but but uh, having something to to look at. It's like oh, I I understand, and then you start to see. Oh, I like this style, or I don't like this style, right? Of writing or or painting or whatever it happens to be. But you get to also know what it is that you do like or you don't like for your own personal expression. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, so I want to start off by laying out two very different data points. So one is from Aristotle himself. You know, when he's comparing history to art, he's saying history simply tells you what is, whereas art tells you what could be and should be. Now, this view of art is not really, so how does this connect with the imitation point? Okay, that's a very different point. Um, I also want to tell you about one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite uh, musicians and that is Ella Fitzgerald. I watched her do an interview and she says, you know, I stole everything. I stole everything. So she takes in all the music in herself and then reworks it. So she is like, I see that there is this amazing YouTube video of, she's saying, oh, the, you know, the country music is like this and the, this music is like that. and." Her version of each of them is actually, it captures what that music is like, but adds her own way to it. And that is when she's even just directly imitating. So what she's doing is that she's taking in all of the world, you know, all of the expression of people before her, mastering it, and then producing something new with her own vision. Now, we are not blank slates. You know, we take in a lot. So if you look at young kids, you can see it very clearly. You know, imitation is a crucial part of learning. You can't learn without imitation. So there is a role, there is a role of imitation at every level. You know, you see something of a, of a great musician, you try to sing it. Well, at that point, you're trying to imitate it or you're trying to draw the lines, you say, or you're saying, okay, how can I get this effect? At that point, you're struggling to imitate something. 
So imitation by itself is trying to, is you trying to match up to something else. And as best as I understand it, it's a crucial part of our human toolkit. And that is how we learn, you know, Tad was bringing up the point about tradition. So there is, you know, these people who are masters of a particular tradition spend years taking in the tradition, building it into their body, you know, their hands, their voice, their, you know, just in their being. And then going beyond it. So, so there are two things involved. One is taking in things. And the second is speaking out. So think, I think of it as a conversation of you're taking in from the world. And the more you drink in from the world, you know, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite artists is, uh, is Louis Sullivan. And in his autobiography, he says that life began to break in upon him. And a continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside was to shape his destiny. Now, breaking in from the outside is you have to say yes and accept what is there to start with. And then you break out. You speak your own understanding of it in your own integration out to the world. And that's a continuous process. That's like a conversation with the world. So there are those two elements. The other angle of it is what you choose to admit it. And how ambitious are you in selecting the palette from which you're, you're going to imitate? Whether you're going to just stick with, you know, okay, my mom and dad and the family around me are doing this, so I'll continue to do that and live that way. And by the way, this doesn't really apply to only to art. This applies to human life itself. You can live an imitative life. You know, René Girard has just beautiful ideas about mimesis and just, you know, people trying to imitate each other and what kind of problems it runs into. So only imitation, unthinking imitation is a recipe for disaster. And then you have envy that develops from it. And then there is scapegoating. All kinds of things happen as a result of that. Your, your, your concept of other, of you know, you're kind of putting everything aside, which is not part of the thing that you're imitating. And you regard that as your enemy. And all of it is just crazy stuff that comes out of pure imitation. So on one hand, we are we have it's a crucial part of our toolkit. On the other hand, it can be completely destructive to any kind of newness. You know, how can you do could be and should be if all you're doing is imitating what is right around you? So that is the dilemma. You know, what is the place of imitation in human life? So I want to put that as a question if people want to uh, further deal with it. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mona. Mona, go ahead. Um, I, um, I, I, I really uh, appreciate this conversation because uh, imitation, you know, like, and and originality. Like, what, what, when, when are you actually authentic? And I understood what I meant that imitation is useful, but also has to be outgrown. <laughs> um, and um. But I wanted to bring up an interesting point here about imitation because uh, authenticity means like being yourself, but also being yourself every moment. Uh, because there's also the danger of imitating myself, <laughs> like um, like just repeating the same thing over and over again. Like I do something original once and then I keep doing the same thing and that's no good. Uh, that's not authentic any longer. So I'm I'm uh, wondering about that. Like, just what does it mean to be authentic, but really present, like 
at every moment? That's a beautiful question. Okay, authentic and present. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's go to Tad next. And anybody who wants to chime in on it, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Would love to hear from anybody. Tad, okay, go ahead. so so in many fields of life, imitation is imitation is marvelous. It's just brilliant. If you're starting a job, if you go to a lawyer or you want to find a dentist, you don't go to a dentist who's got, oh, I've got a really original treatment. Oh, no, my God, no, no, no. You go to a dentist who's been trained in the dental school and you know pretty much that he's going to do the fillings in the way that fillings ought to be done. So imitation provides a standard and it also provides an ideal and I, you know, we very rarely really want an authentic dentist who's found his own special form of treatment. At least I don't. Maybe you do. You maybe you are unusual. And I think this carries over into most areas of life. In most areas of life, including our personal relations, we are actually not being being. We are following roles. We're playing roles as best we can. We don't want our wives and our, our boyfriends and our husbands and so forth we don't, to, to behave in a way which is too unexpected. We actually quite like standardization and we actually like standardization in ourselves. And this sort of great search for personal authenticity is really very much a kind of narcissism, I think. In almost all social roles, what we want is the expected almost by definition if you want something then by def it's very very difficult to want a surprise i mean it's possible but on the whole we're fairly conservative and so the uh, this kind of search for authenticity and stuff is moves into a zone which is impossible really because how would you ever know that you were being authentic if you because you would have nothing to compare it to you couldn't say i'm being authentic today it's like people say i'm who is the real me or i found myself well who were you yesterday you you move into a kind of rather weird mystical zone so i think on the whole we're trying to imitate and that's maybe not too bad actually i leave it to the rest of you Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to go with people who have not spoken before. So I'm going to go to Will, followed by Evanique. Folks, go, I would love to hear your thoughts. Go ahead. Uh, Will, Thank go ahead. Thanks, Srikant. I, it was really, I just thought it was really interesting what Tad said then, um, that, yeah, I think there is like an element of narcissism, which the perhaps the new age movement also is cashing in on this who am I? I'm so special. And um, uh, who's the real me? If I can just discover the real me, then then um, everyone's going to understand how special I am. I think this is, is born of narcissism. But I would also say that there is an authentic self which you can measure. And that would be when something feels right. You sort of gravitate towards something and you dwell within an experience it doesn't feel like you're faking it um and then this is when which i found interesting in relation to what tad said that's when it can become unnerving to those around you because it's like he's not or she's not behaving the way they formerly did and the reason for that is because they're no longer tolerating things that are just too much effort and they're pretending so it's really interesting i think um, the, the authenticity can be born of narcissism, but I would say that such a thing does also exist as well. That's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Will. A great observation. When isn't this a fascinating discussion? You know, this is kind of art imitating life and life imitating art. We're coming coming to many many themes which are about life itself, and then we're going back and looking at art, I mean, that's really the power of art. It allows you to reflect about life. You know, it puts things in such a dramatic way that it engenders this reflection, you know, self-reflection about life. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique, Paul, and Tad. Evanique. Yeah, just a couple of points um, that I thought of during this discussion. When Mona was talking about... Um, you know, imitating yourself. 
I think, you know, that's also could be known in, in life as staying stuck, right? Staying in what you think is in that uh, comfortable place. And then um, really, it, it's it's really, you think it's comfortable, but then it's uncomfortable because you know you're made for something better, which ties into what Will and Tad were saying. And, um, you know, I, and I think it loops in in terms of authenticity. You know, uh, it's one thing I, I agree with uh, what they were both saying. It's one thing just to be like, oh, I'm special just because I'm special. And it, it, it could come off as uh, narcissistic. Um, you know, I just want to be original. I just want to do something original just for the sake of doing something original. Um, it's not authentic to who you are. It's just that I would say, in my opinion, it's just that you're trying to impress people eat or shock people. But the point is you're trying to get the attention on you. And it's not necessarily who you are, but you're just trying to be, like uh, Will said, you're just trying to be special just for the sake of being special. When you have to try, you're not that special, you know? It, but then there is the thing that Mona was talking about where you could just be happy in your everyday life and then you know something needs to change. Um, and like in terms of art and, and in terms of, you know that you, you've gotten bored with your style or, you know, you've gotten bored. And so you have to either like take a break from it. Like a lot of artists take a break because they know that they're not coming up with anything that inspires them. And I think that's the key to all art forms, no matter which one, is does it inspire you? Now, it may not inspire you five years from now, but at that moment that you're creating or that moment that you're listening, does it inspire you? Um, does it entertain you? Uh, does it, you know, what does it do for you? So I, I think that those are the two key things. And and I think imitation is great. Um when it's an inspiration, but um, just be careful of it because then it could just become you being lazy. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Um, I'm going to always give, you know, uh, get more people in the conversation. So we're going to go with Marco, Paul, and Tad. Marco, go ahead. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily like, um, that a person is trying to, you know, like they just want to be special or I, I also think it's just a matter of, um, that a person is just trying to, you know, um, do the, get to the best of their abilities. Like they're just, you know, um, you know, they're just trying their hardest to, you know, to do to to do something at the they're testing themselves to to better themselves i think it's sort of also like a you know it's there's a lot of inner work that goes into you know making something original and um you know it's like uh yeah uh yeah wonderful thank you thank you marco um you know it's See, this is this is very deep, deep topic, and we'll we'll come at it. It's just amazing conversation. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Paul, followed by Tad. Paul. Yeah, I think my way of reconciling this tension between narcissism, like me, 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 and and uh, the sort of find your voice, hero's journey, all these noble concepts of discovering your authentic self, which are valid and important for artists. And I, one way I reconcile them is by um, the people who do the attribution. So my example are like of the opposite is Joni Mitchell always thought, would say Bob Dylan is just, everything he does is fake. None of it is his own, none of it. And everyone just thought she hated him but the only the truth behind that is some of his songs like bob dylan's dream is lord franklin a really old ballad 
and he took the exact melody. He didn't change one note, and he didn't tell anybody. That's the part I'm talking about. As opposed to that famous inventor school who said, if I have done things, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. If I see the attribution, they can take anything they want because they're going to synthesize it with themselves. But I ask for attribution to distinguish the narcissist, and so does digital rights, so does the law, to distinguish the hero's journey and the find your, your inner voice from the narcissist. There's, those are my thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, it just this is uh, so, so wonderful. Um, next, uh, let's go to, let's see, Eleanor followed by Tad. Eleanor. I think there are two different types of, maybe there, maybe there are, not, there are narcissists, but there's also, I think it gets mistaken. Uh, Eleanor, can you speak into the mic a little bit yeah. more? Okay, sorry. I think that, you know, sometimes people mistake it for narcissism when people are young and feel um, energy, inspiration, and want to do stuff and believe in themselves. I think it's very important because if you are missing on this, you will never move forward. So this is not narcissism, it's actually creational drive, which can be mistaken for narcissism. Um, later on, um, yeah, I, I can't explain it, but I have <laughs> seen it. Um, there are two different things, and uh, I think they get mistaken one for another one. But um, the creational belief system and drive of, is very important to get money when you are artist. Because if you don't do this way, you may uh, skip on earnings. And people may not work with you if you are too quiet. Um, you have to attract teams. It's still, even in my visual wor world, we work in big teams. So people always follow loud people. And loud people tend to give you more security, even if they may be not so good, but they just have a character where they give you security. And people love those people. So we need them too. Um, um, narcissism is something else, you know, there are not so many narcissists, actually, in my opinion, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eleanor. These are just amazing range of comments. Um, next up is going to be Tad followed by Will. Tad. Um, regarding, um, it, there's a book called Hideous Kinky by um, Esther Freud, and uh, a very good movie, actually, in which... Um, the principal character takes her daughter to a Sufi monastery and he asks her what on earth she's doing in Morocco, wandering around. And she says, I'm looking for myself. And he sort of sighs. This a real elderly Sufi sighs. He says, go back to London. <laughs> go back to London and get a job, basically, which I, is, is a marvellous scene, you know, in a response to her sort of, you know, obsessive self-interest, which is causing her children increasing sort of anxiety. Um, the two other comments, fake it till you make it. That's something to think about, which is a kind of nice American expression. The third area is Oscar Wilde's idea, the theory of masks. That is to say, there are only poses. There's no authentic you. You can put on a certain mask. The mask will suit you. The mask describes who you are better than any revelation of the authentic self. Everything is supposition. Everything is a social role. Uh, social role. Um, there is there is no authentic you. That is some kind in Oscar Wilde anyway. At least this is regarded with is in terms of artistic produce, something very, very dubious. And obviously he plays about with that very well in the plays, which are in fact extremely funny even today. And they're funny because they're truthful, because I think whenever the idea that, um, the idea of deliberately being authentic is so obviously absurd, you know, to wake up in the morning and I'm, I'm going to be the real me, 
I, I'm, I'm surprised that the absurdity of this doesn't grasp the rest of the people in the group. I leave it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tad. It's just amazing range of opinions here. So I, you know, this is uh, just great conversation. So I, I look forward to going go, going through the or all the things that are being presented here. Uh, next up is going to be Will followed by Sabrina. Will. Thanks, Rakan. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm quite um, interested in authenticity. And uh, I just wanted to clarify that when I said sometimes seeking originality or being uh, particularly creative uh, might seem narcissistic, I, I didn't mean in regards to art. I mean, you could never blame an artist for trying to be original, um, especially, you know, coming up with original concepts or philosophical points perhaps through their art in such a crazy world, who could blame someone for aspiring to be different and original? So I just wanted to clarify, I didn't mean in the context of artistic um, pursuit. I just meant like the self-help industry. Uh, we, I think self-help books are the most common ones you will find in secondhand bookshops because <laughs> most people don't really get much out of them and um, give them away. But with the self-help, it's often about be yourself, just be yourself. And it does that does sometimes seem to relate to narcissism. So I just wanted to clarify that. I wasn't talking about artistic pursuits and narcissism. And also I wanted to say I found it very interesting what Eleanor said. Um, with the loud people seem to have more influence. And I heard somewhere that like, if somebody's got a philosophical um, notion or concept and philosophers of the past have also been, their popularity, sorry, has been measured somewhat by their charisma. And charisma sometimes seems to be more important than what one is actually saying. That happens a fair bit. And I think it's because we're in the primate species and uh, it's somehow related to our wanting to be socially accepted, to be on the winning team. So if somebody's good looking and charismatic, that's what we want. You know, generally speaking, whereas the, the value of what they're actually conveying may not be as high. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, next up is Sabrina, followed by Eleanor. Sabrina. So, oops, I I think um, imitating others when there is a particular goal um, that you're trying to follow. So let's say um, you're starting to write and you're listening to your favorite writer and he says, okay, these are my habits, right? This is This is how I approach it. I sit down every day, even if I don't, you know, don't get any much done or anything done worth it. I sit down every day and write something, right? So you are imitating other people's behavior, but it's of benefit to you, right? It doesn't mean that you're going to become that person, right? But you can, when you imitate other people's habits that are good, um, and, and you learn to see how they are, um, accomplishing what they are accomplishing, right? How did they get to where they are? I, I think it's also a good thing uh, when when we start to sort of um, digest and break down. And obviously, with time, you're going to make your own your own schedule, your own idea. You might just you might sit down fifty minutes here, fifty minutes there. Who knows? But but at the beginning, it I think it's good when even like if you're you want to get back in shape, right? Um, um, how do others do it, right? Which is a lot of what we do. How did others accomplish it? Uh, and eventually, you make it your own, um, where it works for you. So so I think that's that's something that that is of service, and it doesn't mean that you're not being yourself is you're making a new you, right? A new you wants to be born. How can he be born or she be born, right? How how can it flourish? And it's by uh, studying the habits of others that have accomplished what you're looking to do. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Next up is Eleanor and Mona. Eleanor. You know, um, one can be also more creative and artistic just with dreaming, even not with making. I prefer personally to team up with people who are loud and dream a lot and can sell it. And then you have the money and then I would make it all. I'm very technical, so I just don't like to talk. And I think people have to find each other. And it's very important uh, to, because sometimes when you, when you do it and you suffer while you're doing it, you don't, you stop dreaming. You, you want to stop people of dreaming because it's so hard to do. But you need someone who is not doing and dreaming. Like let's uh, let's put uh, another rooftop, or let's put uh, one more garage, <laughs> number five, or uh, and you have to do it. So you put a lid on it, you know. And these are two different worlds. You can be artistry and creative in just dreaming, and you need it too. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eleanor. Next up is Mona. Yes, I wanted to come back uh, about this discussion on um, authenticity. Um, I was thinking about imitation, that it becomes a habit, then it, it precludes one from paying attention to what's actually alive in the moment. And what's more most valuable about the creative pursuit to me, it feels like just to get in touch with what's alive in the moment, what needs an expression in the moment. So if if I keep on repeating, either whether myself or someone else, if I keep repeating the same thing over and over, I'm not getting to notice what is it that it's alive now <laughs> or whether or not it needs an expression. So that's uh, that's the point that I was trying to make um, on, on imitation has having its own value up to a point and then needs to be outgrown so that it doesn't get in the way of, of actually noticing what's actually alive in the moment. Thank you. So now I would like to comment on various things that are said here. Um, I want to say that I think the entire, a large number of comments here are very much from the modern angle. Okay, the, the modern culture, modern American culture that we live in is a subjectivist culture. So they everything is formed, is kind of, is expressed in terms of, I feel this, I, I react to this. And so it's all kind of react, a lot of reactive. Now, I want to show you what is missing? Okay, what is missing from all this discussion? And I think the best capturing of that I've seen is by C.S. Lewis, Lewis uh, in a book called Abolition of Man. Okay, so it's, 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 it's a very complex point, but I'm gonna to try to make it because I'm sure many of the people here disagree with this point, uh, but I still need to make it. Uh, I wanna make it and would love to hear your comments on it, because I think that's very much uh, the modern way of looking looking at life, looking at not just art, but life as such. Mm -hmm. um, what C.S. Lewis points out is that what is missing in the modern world is the Tao, you know, basically a universal principle that is shaping things. And it's all about Things it's all, all about in putting it in the language of language of Tao Te Ching. Tao Te Ching. It is all about ten thousand things. So you can say, oh, you just pick a different of the ten thousand things, and you're just imitating different parts of it, and you're just going around. But what what is missing from this entire, you know, from a lot of discussion in modern times, is the Tao. And Aristotle has it, you know, when he's talking about what could be and should be. You know, the Bhagavad Gita has it when it describes things like Atma and Brahma and the core of your being and you relating to other people from the core of your being. Because it is nothing to do with all the imitative self that you have. It is about something fundamental about us, about nature, 
that is the reference point. Aristotle also has it. The Stoics have it. The Bible has it. You know, we've studied Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching Bhagavad Gita, and Bible in parallel. And one of the concepts that we used, which was very effective, center versus periphery. The modern world actually says there is no center. There is only periphery. And once you do that, everything is just imitation because there is really no reference point. People like Louis Sullivan have a formulation of form follows function. So it is trying to get at the function, something that is creative, that it generates everything else. In modern times, whenever people think of creative, they think, oh, I have a different emotion. But that is also a form. It is one of the 10,000 things. So it is being, you know, when Louis Sullivan is talking about function or Gita is talking about Atma or Tao Te Ching is talking about the Tao or uh, the Bible is talking about living water. It's all about this kind of central creative force that you're trying to go back to. You have a tendency of that force forming these forms which become ossified and you identify yourself with the forms and forget the living source. It's like the true wine. You know, it's like you're trying to go, go back to this living thing and not just be focused on the fruit. And you take the fruit and you say, now I'm good, I'm, I'm God. I have everything, I know everything because I have the fruit. Versus always having the humility to say, what is life? And trying to reconnect with the life again and again and again. This is the same issue uh, that Mona brought up about authenticity and being present, even in the context of you imitating yourself. I mean, this is the idea of old man and new man. You know, you're always carrying everything that you've done with you, your emotions, your thoughts, your habits, the people around you, your house, your wealth, your social position, you're carrying all of that with you. Owen Barfield does a beautiful job of saying the artistic experience is the experience of felt transformation. It is seeing something fundamentally new about yourself, not just something else, but something which is the root cause from which lots of things proceed. So it is being able to see something deep about the fundamental nature of human beings, about yourself, about existence. Even in consumption of great art, that's what a great artist does for you. Now imagine the statue of David in the, in the courtyard, open courtyard, and people coming out of the Middle Ages, what kind of a view of human being that is as compared to what people are used to? And just by looking at it, people can see a possibility of human existence, which is different. The same thing with Beethoven, the same thing with literature of, you know, for me, it is lit literature of Victor Hugo, for example, of showing something that is possible of this grandeur in the most simple street urchin, Taurosh. You can say, wow, that, what kind of a person is this? And that is seen in person after person after person, all the bad guys and the good guys and the side characters. So that notion that there is something fundamental in us underpins some of the great art and some of the great discussion about art in the scribal times in the olden days. Today, like moment you leave that, you say there is no such thing as the Tao. There is no such thing as universal principles. You lose both science and art. What you have is just mirrors reflecting each other with no light at all. So, you know, that's that's my thought. Let's go with Paul followed by Tad. Paul. That was beautiful, Srikant. And um, I want to propose kind of a yes and rather than a disagreement with you or 
the opposing point of view, but a yes and, which is the way Oscar Wilde is kind of right is people and in that story of the Sufi and the girl and other stories, people think they've uncovered or are uncovering the authentic self, but they're really just at one more layer of the onion. And that's why Oscar Wilde is right. You keep going, this is really me, but it's really just another role. And I think the spiritual traditions talk about you got to keep going layer by layer, like the veil, there's still one veil of desire and left. The ego is not, it's still there. So those views of no center are sort of realistic because people can't find it and they really don't think, don't haven't found it, even if they think they found it. And the girl in the faraway country talking to the Sufi, the self she's talking about finding isn't a self even worth finding. But all that doesn't mean that there is a universal core there. So that's why it's yes and. So that's a, that's my reconciliation of what you're talking Wonderful. about. Wonderful. I mean, the, the thing is that you know people like Oscar Wilde are brilliant at taking apart the pretensions of people. You know, all of us are full of pretensions. Okay, and pretensions are simply the forms which are masquerading as function. You're saying it's like you know Leonardo used to say those that those that deck themselves in the works of others will not allow me dignity of mine. So there is a lot of clearing that needs to be done in culture, in each of us, including myself, most emphatically. And somebody like Oscar Wilde is very good at clearing out these layers, you know, these ossified layers, you know, of skin, which have become hardened and you identify yourself as that hard skin, skin and stop go growing as a result. And he's showing, no, 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 this is nothing. And taking off that skin is good for you. And that, that is the value of it. But on the flip side, many of the people like Oscar Wilde who don't, I don't know Oscar Wilde that well. You know, I think he's incredibly funny, incredibly sharp. His observations are amazing. But I think he is also in the modern tradition. He himself will say there is no center. There is no center. So there is no such thing as, as that. And that's where I disagree. I think most people who think that they are at the center are not at the center. So I think it requires a combination of what I think I, I like to call ambitious humility. So humility on one hand and ambitiousness on the other hand. and like you produce something and then look at it as if somebody else produced it and say, hey, what did you do? And you're going around with that. That's the idea, the old Greek idea of metanoia. So you're going beyond whatever ideas you produce and you do that all the time. And that is what creation is. You know, you, you, you keep on bursting these things and you don't do that just because somebody criticizes you. You do that that wanting to break through these things comes comes from within. All right, next up is going to be Tad followed by Mike. Tad. Um, well, um, Oscar Wilde studied philosophy, didn't he? So um, he, 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 he regarded himself primarily as a ph philosopher and secondarily as a writer. So as a, as a writer, as a playwright. So, um, and I think he's regarded himself as a Neoplatonist. Um, I think I ask you all, I mean, how can you be anyone else other than who you are? I mean, this whole discussion is somewhat bizarre. You know, you can only be you, I'm afraid. You may not like it. You may imagine yourself to be very multi-layered, like a gigantic onion and terribly deep. But you are you, however you are. So, you know, unless you have a kind of, unless you have an, uh, you know, identical twin somewhere, I'm afraid you're left with you. And the search for you, you is kind of pretty easy. You're in that chair now. You know, it's kind of simple. So I do think Shirkant is kind of adding this kind of, you're bringing some mysticism into all this 
kind of interesting, but I don't really, it just seems like a fog to me, I'm afraid. The That's, other thing I would point out is that originality in art is very, very rare. Let's do one thing. Let people respond to that because that's an important point. And then I'll come to you for the second point. Uh, I'll respond very quickly. You know, um, the person who has kind of captured this the best is uh, Carl Jung. Uh, he distinguishes between, uh, you know, persona and self. You know, people actually appear different. You know, they want to wear some things. They have all, all of this. So this is a question of, it's, this is a very deep point. Um, let, let me see how to approach it. Let, let me actually let other people respond to this if they want. Uh, Will, would you like to respond? Go ahead. Thanks, Shrikant, uh, Ted. Yeah, um, I, I can see what Ted means to a fair degree. I mean, all there is at the moment is this self in the chair, which objectively is a result of everything you've experienced in your life, physically and, um, and mentally, I guess. That is like an objective self. Every time you pretended, you faked it, um, the, this accumulation of experience is the objective self that sits in the chair now. But to me, being authentic is about, and it's not easy to do, but it's not pretending. So you're not being authentic when you're doing things like, we, you know, having, you know, when you, to me, it's like, it might be a strange analogy, but when you're having a chat to someone like an acquaintance, you're going through the motions, you don't particularly find anything they're saying interesting but you're entertaining them. Um, and of course, you need a modicum of decorum and this is a social element to it. But when you continually fall into habits of of not being your authentic self in that you are entertaining um, experiences which are not enjoyable. And in fact, you have an aversion to, but you're doing it for the sake of others. Um, that's So that's where authenticity is interesting to me to just sort of gravitate towards that, which feels right. Like, you'd know, Tad being an Englishman, when you hit the cricket ball off the sweet spot in the center of the bat, and it just feels correct. But a lot of our life, it doesn't feel right. We're just sort of going through the motions and we're feeling somewhat constrained and harnessed. So mm -hmm. I see what you mean with the objective self, that is all you can be. But to me, authenticity is about going to which that which just sort of feels right on almost on a vibrational level thank you sure um uh, thank you very well put uh well what i want to do is i want to let uh tad complete his second point and then uh, everybody can uh respond because this is again I mean, look look at this beautiful thing uh you know you, you have aristotle's poetics we're talking about aristotle's poetics and now we have come to the concept of self you know what is the concept of self and how, how do you think about it? What's the proper way of thinking about it? Um, go ahead, Tad, you make your other point and then we'll go to Mike. Um, I just want to, yeah, I, I'll start off by re repeating Will's statement on a vibrational level, okay? I'll, I'll leave that with the group because that's just so marvelously Californian. I can't, you know, I, th I thank you for that and it brought a great smile to my face. So wonderful, I love that stuff. It, but it's, you know, you, you know, um, if you're pretend, if I'm pretending to be a dog, woof, 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 that's me pretending to be a dog. It's me pretending to be a dog. I may not be really a dog. I know I'm not really a dog, but it's me faking to be a dog. There's not really, it's not very complex. <laughs> you know, I, it's just not, it's just, you, you guys are creating a kind of, you know, you know, Californian sort of, you know, cloud of marijuana cloud going everywhere. It's fun, but it's kind of kooky, you know. When you're pretending, you remain the same person because it's a self-conscious act of temporary transformation. There's just not a problem there. The other two points, number two, um, uh, I would say Shirkrant's ideas about creativity are rooted in people who are really, really original artists, like michelangelo these are kind of these are the muhammad ali's of the creative world they, these are one one in every 200 year artists and they usually happen when there's a major cultural economic shift technological shift and they're produced they're not 
They're a kind of product of their time. It's not really that they're very expert navel gazers. They're sort of a product of a series of cultural shifts. Michelangelo himself was a product of particular training of schools. And at some point, suddenly there's a, very suddenly there's a technological shift usually, and it produces suddenly this kind of crop of new artists. You can see it very distinctly and clearly in the in the in the changes of of style in pop music actually, where suddenly new formats formats are introduced, such as the album or the forty five single or a new market like teenagers, and suddenly a whole style of musical genius appears. It's not. It appears to be a kind of magic. Phil Spector is really great, but he's a product of a sudden technological shift, which is the creation of the teenage teenage market because suddenly American teenagers and the oil boom have lots of extra money. But I would say on the whole, originally originality in art is very, very unusual. And if you go around the big museums, you see lots and lots of copies. Artists who are more or less the same. School of Paris, French school, 1800. And it's all a bit of a blur, sometimes really good. But I would say Sher Krant's idea about art is far, far too ambitious for humanity in general. Those are my cases. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tad. And thank you very much for you know putting forth this contrary view uh, about uh, human beings. Um, so let's go with, uh, let's see. Um, I'm trying to decide. Let, let's go with uh, Mike. I'll give you two minutes. Well, let's see what happens. Um, you, it's interesting that you brought uh, C.S. Lewis and uh, into the picture. Uh, and C.S. Lewis has a, a, explained some of these tie-ins with uh, in a really nice way and he t and um of all people marshall McLuhan uh commented on that conversation in a um in in a show in a uh, conversation with um buckminster fuller and of uh, norbert weiner there's a concept in psychology called neurolinguistic programming as to how different people evoke emotions and uh, emotional responses. Some people, it is, it's embedded in language. Some people will say, I see what you're saying. I understand what you mean. I feel in my gut that this is what you mean. Uh, what uh, C.S. Lewis in the uh, screw tape letters uh, described how the, uh, how the devil uh, puts together uh, visions of music and art and and words to uh, to convince uh, his uh, uh, his subjects as to as to the right, what what he what the devil wants to do. Now, C.S. Lewis wasn't a Satan a Satanist. He was uh, he was a evangelical Christian, really. And uh, wanted to show, to reduce the devil to absurdity, but to show how the devil worked in this. Uh, now, Marshall McLuhan uh, uh, used NLP and discussed it in a conversation in a preface to some book that I read a while back, where he, where Marshall McLuhan, Buckminster Fuller, and Norbert Weiner, who's a, a brilliant mathematician, all of them deceased right now. Uh, described uh, how they how neurolinguistic programming tie all this together. Uh, in terms of tying them all together, Gödel, Escher, and Bach showed the imagination that uh, even Bach, who supposedly uh, was just a musician, used his uh, the mathematical concept of how the fugue uh, is uh, uh, has a complicated mathematical structure. That uh, ties um, that creates word pictures, and uh, there's some complicated things that tie all these together. So all the arts is the the initial question that which is your favorite um, is perceptive, but they're all tied together. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Great observations. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go with. Um, so firstly, I want to thank uh, Tad. For bringing up me, I, I mean, and I agree that what we are doing here is actually anachronistic. 
you know, most modern thinkers do not agree with uh, most of the things that we do here, because what we are doing is actually based on a very different, like people like Marshall McLuhan, but Minister Fuller would, um, because they do think that there is a Tao, there is some core principle that runs through nature. So would Newton, so would Darwin, that there is a core principle and you are always working with reference to that. And that's what you're trying to do in your life, in your science, in your art, in everything that you do. And that view is actually not, it's completely contrary to most, the way in which most modern things about life, about art, about science. So we're, it's definitely something which is different. And, um, you know, so let, let's, let's go, and I would love to you now focus the discussion on the idea of self. Um, let's go with Sabrina, Mona, and Paul. Sabrina. Okay, so I guess I'll go with my second part, not my first part. <laughs> um, I, I think what happens is that that distinction of being your authentic self um, is we run on the programs, right? I, I think that's when you're not when, when you really want to do something else or be something else, but because of what you are told, what you have lived, um, you keep on this path that doesn't feel right for you. And, and you know that you're just not happy where you're at, right? That you're missing something. And, and I think it's it's that part of you that, wants to express itself differently. And, and when you are with that one, I think you go more into this flow. Now I don't want to use new age language for Tad, but <laughs> but part of it is I, lo I love it. I love it. I want more. No, I want Tad, more Tad, vibrations. Tad, Tad, Bring Tad, us the vibrations. Tad, 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 please let people talk. Okay. Uh, um, so but 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 I think I know when I am because my poem writes itself. I don't write it, right? When I'm when I'm connected to me, it it just appears, right? The painting appears. There there is no I'm going to leave this my space or do these colors or do these things, right? It just I I'm just picking up color and doing the painting and it will happen in just a couple of hours. Um, and with the poem, it's, it's almost as is, is being dictated. Like it's not coming out of me, um, but it just writes itself. So that's when I know I am in the vow, right? Like the, just w when I am, completely connected to me and not worrying about form, shape, color, or any of those things, but simply being. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Um, and folks, use your own words, use your own authentic expression. You don't have to match or try to answer anybody in particular. You're trying to answer the question about the self. What, what do you think about this concept? Uh, Mona followed by Paul. Thank you, Srikant. Um, I want to uh, build up on what Sabrina just said um, about uh, what to me um, self is. Well, I don't know. That's the that's the thing. If I go in on a habitual basis, then I know the habits. But when I stop and I'm curious about what else is out there, I find out that I don't know. Um, and, and in that moment, there's the possibility that something new might happen that's different than my original habits. And that's the moment that I'm calling authentic, is that the moment where something new <laughs> that I don't know <laughs> might come about. Uh, and, and then if I keep being curious about it, then I will investigate, I will find out. But I, I'm, I'm not in a position to say I know. <laughs> what that is. Thank you, Mona. Next up, thank you. Uh, next up is Paul. Yeah, I can just keep going down the path. 
Um, and don't don't comment, Ted, but I'm 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 sympathetic because you're going to just cringe as more and more people pile on this this what you call yeah like have another hit. I know you're thinking, but I'm going to pile on in a way that maybe will reach you, as as you have your very clear veil and persona on that has a lot of very strong opinions, but. And we all do, every one of us, and I do too. And the guy, the difference between us though, and the guy who starts barking like a dog, is it would only be the same if he didn't realize that whether or not he was imitating a dog. But there's a real human experience that happens. It may not be happening to you, where you suddenly go, wait, that, that entity that's talking and just did that, you know, insulted somebody or or lived a certain way or chose a certain job, that doesn't feel like it's coming from the place in me that I consider the deepest, that there, there must be some way. You get into this journey of trying to understand what part of you is the deepest part. And you do start thinking about metaphorically, and you do start wondering why, when you're searching for some kind of satisfaction or happiness in the world, and you find that you can't just say, well, whoever I am, I'm just me sitting in this chair. That's unsatisfactory. One becomes completely unsatisfied with that and goes on this journey. Uh, uh, and it's real human consciousness, and it's not new age because it's gone on as long as the human species has, and it's in all the writings. And it needs to be given some credibility. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, actually, let me go ahead and uh, talk, and then I'll uh, hand it to uh, Evanik. So, and this is a very deep issue. Okay. This is a question of, I think it's a question of epistemic humility, if I wanted to put it that way. There is the territory, there is the world, and there is the map. You're making map of the world. You are making the map. The territory is just what it is. So first, let me try to describe it about the outside world. If you really want to map out the world and map it in its entire grandeur of all the factors moving around, not a static map, but of how everything is moving on earth. Let's keep it simple. Let's keep on just on earth. Okay, everything on earth. How does it move? And you wanted to create a map of that, right? You, whatever you do, whatever you do, your map is going to be inadequate. And you have to always hold open. You have to say, it is what it is. I am trying to grasp it. My grasping ability is limited and I will be open to new things. And I will pay close attention to things that do not agree with my map and be ready to destroy the map and recreate a new one. And you need that attitude if you really want to understand just the earth. That is the scientific approach, by the way. I Somebody like Newton, at the end of his life, when everybody thought he had really figured out everything, that's what everybody else thought. His quote is that, I do not know how others may view me, but as for myself, I seem to have been but a boy playing on the seashore who found some seashells shinier than the others while the entire ocean of truth lies undiscovered. That is the scientific approach. That is the core of science, of saying, it is what it is. I am trying to understand it. I know only some things about it. I want to know more. This is about the external world. The same applies to the internal world in spades. The concepts, I'll use the concepts. We've done like 50 meetups on Carl Jung. I'll use the concept of 
unconscious and conscious. Just like there are things that you have not seen. There are things going on. Our brains are amazing. There are billions and billions of things. There are automatic processes going on which are keeping us alive. You know, just look at primates and how much goes on in them. Almost very tiny fraction of it is conscious. Making what is unconscious conscious is an achievement. And the same thing, same principle of saying you have to have humility, epistemic humility. If you have identified yourself as being something that is conscious, what is your conscious of? There's a lot more going on in you. There is pretense and you don't even know there is that you're pretending something. You're actually denying it and you're thinking of something, but it's something else going on. And there's a lot of that that goes on in us. And the journey towards authenticity is the journey towards the truth. Journey towards the authenticity as best as I understand it in the inner world is analogous to a scientist trying to make and remake and re remake his maps in order to capture the territory as best as he possibly can. So it is the same thing. Now it is true that there are a lot of people and you, we are talking about modern culture, modern culture, everybody is emotionalist. So they will pretend to actually going for the center when it is something else, just like most scientists do. do. They are just playing around with ideas of other people without really understanding it. But that's not the case with people like Faraday or Darwin or Newton. Um, I also think that these people are not exceptions in the sense that it is that we stop ourselves. And so they are not superhuman. They are human too. This ability both of art and science is something that is reachable. We may not, may not reach the stage of them, but that kind of a process is within reach of more people than they you know, more people than they think that they are, they can do that. So I think people undersell themselves in that way. Um, so what, what I'm saying is that it is an analogous process. As best as I understand it, you know, when you look at the Tao, you know, it's very much this worldly. When you look at you know, Bhagavad Gita, it is very much, you know, it's like you can do karma yoga and you can do bhakti yoga and you can do jnana yoga and you can do dhyana yoga. And this is all how they are related to each other. It is all about understanding the way in which the human faculties are put together. The same thing with, with, with the Bible. Also, they're trying, these are stories, these are very early versions of trying to get at philosophy. They do it in a different way. And you really need to get into it in order to figure out what they're doing. So this is, you know, this is how, you know, I'm, I'm thinking and I, I'm fully aware that what, what I'm saying here and what many people are saying here is not what is common in, in modern times. And there are many, many ways of making fun of, of what, what we are saying. And uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, so the next up is going to be Evanique, followed by Tat. Evanique. I wanted to introduce a new concept into this theory of self. And that what if you could create the self that you want it to be and have it be authentic? And I think in terms of art and poetry, one could acquire, like if one wanted to be a writer, one could learn certain skills through imitation and coaching and teaching, which is kind of what I think Aristotle's trying to do here. And, you know, through the, the method of learning, make themselves into a great writer. In the sense, there's the creative process. So if one wants to be creative, you could do the work 
and, and study it and be creative that way. And part of that would be imitation, but you would still, in a sense, be creating the self you want and the life you want, you know, the life of the artist being able to create oneself and still be at the center. Like you could be, you know, creating the self that the set that you know at the core you are meant to be, even if you're not that right now. You may have to create that for yourself. So I, I wanted to introduce that into the conversation. And um I have to say, Sharika, I love your faith in humanity. And I think I think that's what artists speak to is humanity and they show they just don't show the, the happy parts. They a true artist knows that there's shades. I always think of it like a painting, right? If you're looking at a painting, oh my gosh, uh, uh Leonardo, no, oh, yeah, Leonardo da Vinci, right? He had these. He had a great. I think I don't know if I have the name right for some reason. I'm doubting myself, but anyway. He always had this thing where he did shades, right? Shades of light, shades of dark. If you look at his work, it's beautiful because it has that shades. It's not just one monotone thing and that's life. Life is not just one monotone thing. It has shades. And I think if you can remain at the core of who you are and create the life that you want for yourself and while still remaining who you are, I think that's key. And I think that's, I think in terms of art, Aristotle's trying to teach you methods, right? He, he's trying to give you certain tips, but he, these tips are not meant to just be the, the be all and end all. It's kind of like the basics and then you build on it and you bring yourself to it. And then that's what makes art great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evany. I, I want to, uh, build on just one thing and then hand it over to Tad. Um, I mean, the intermediate term here is that of ideal. Like when you're trying to say you're trying to imitate the ideal, you're saying this is the ideal and I'm trying to imitate it. That or this thing, this is what could be and should be that is being held up for you. And you are trying to be like that as best as you can. Now that captures both the imitative nature and the Tao in one because it is, and that ideal is drawn from the real because it's what could be. And it is moving towards the thing that gives you the maximum fecundity. That is what it should be. It has the maximum life in it. And you're holding that up and you're saying, how do I get there? So in that process of choosing the idea, and that's what art does again and again and again, because that's, you know, art at its best. Now they will show you something that you had not seen before about yourself and allows you to experience it, gives you the courage to actually build that uh, into you. All right, next up is Tad. Tad, go ahead. Um, I'm I'm slightly surprised that your your language is it's, it, at the same time, um, Shikran. It's very interesting listening to you because at the same time you talk about how people here are coming from a contemporary, um, uh, rather an Americanized cultural direction. But it strikes me that you are doing the same actually, um, and I find it sort of ironical that at the same time is criticizing that you use the sort of language of authenticity, selfhood, and so on, which is actually very very central to contemporary experience and i find it ironical because out of the pre-modern period the renaissance people wouldn't talk about showing themselves in their art they, they just wouldn't they would be producing paintings which describe scenes in biblical or in classical mythology and they would try to do it in a way that was original or new or brought their own um, particular skills and directions to it, but they wouldn't lay a great claim about it being their true self. So, um, Evany rather marvelously introduced, uh, we were building up these phraseologies, but we had now also have the true artist. You know, where's the fake artist? You know, let's look at the fakes for a bit, because they're kind of interesting, I think. Um, and I think most 
um, what you know, what does it really mean to be a true artist? I mean, very strange. We also have in the discussion entering this idea, which is very union, where we start talking about we, the we. And it, as ever, there's a kind of intellectual arrogance there. And I always run a mile when people, it's usually politicians, talk about we. And you think, wait a second. No, you mean you or I, but you're not talking about me. You know what I mean? And so when people start talking about we, and that's very much part of the, the union idea, oh, the collective consciousness, collective consciousness, oh, right, okay, where is it? You know, it's, it's you, you're, you enter, you know, the marijuana flu, fumes start billowing all the way from, well, in this case, Switzerland somewhere. Um, in addition, you talk about scientific method. Well, observation, as you describe Newton looking at the shells, is part of scientific method. But there's also just slow slog experimentation and statistical crunching, um, those are pretty necessary too. Um, someone talks about the act of painting. Well, I'm a painter. And yes, every now and again, things come together and it's really great. And you think, my God, I've done a really good picture for a, for a surprise. But the real comparison is it's actually much more similar to being a footballer. You've made various maneuvers. You practice them over and over again. And by happenstance, suddenly you kick the ball. It bounces in exactly the right way. Everything comes together and you score that goal. And it looks as if it's magic. But actually, you've done hours and hours of practice repeatedly kicking a ball at various angles over the last, you know, six weeks. So it's not really magic, but it sort of feels like it because it's so good. So, I mean, there's just this tendency that the group seems to have, you know, entered into it to mystify unnecessarily and start with bizarre, mystical, sort of pseudo-Christian concepts about authenticity of self, none of which are very happily defined, except in terms of negatives, like, you know when you're not being yourself. I mean, you know, do you? I mean, how do you know when you're not being yourself? Because you can only be yourself. So how can you not know that you're... It's a kind of weird hall of mirrors. I leave those those points with you. Thank you. It's very enjoyable. Keep the vibrations going. I love them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tad. Um, so let me answer a few of these and then hand it over to Paul. Um, so firstly, we... So what, what does we mean? Okay. Uh, we've been doing these meetups for the, you know, since COVID started, we've done about 2000 meetups. Um, we do this every day. So we is basically a lot of conversation on various topics that we've had. And as a result of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, there is some commonality of interest, ideas, positions, values, et cetera, that have developed over time. So this is a real community, just like if you were to go to a family, you would say when they're saying we, they mean that they've been together for some time. If you're going into an office and you're saying that it's we, that means they have been working together for so long and that's what is meant by we. It doesn't mean that, obviously this is all individuals Everybody has different opinions. They have different various backgrounds. They are from different places. So that is the meaning of we, that we actually have a community. Um, and there is no reason not to use the word community, uh, to use the word we for a community. Uh, it is done all the time. I think it's completely legitimate use of English language. Now, it is true that um, I've been using the modern language in order to talk about this issue. Uh, and really, I would rather use Greek. Uh, and we have, you know, I, I would rather use Greek or Mandarin or Sanskrit, because really those these ideas are better expressed in that. And that's what we've done. We've done about 100 meetups on Bhagavad Gita where a gentleman who spoke Sanskrit, who has read all the major Sanskrit commentaries, came and spoke to us and explained word by word what these things mean. mean. Uh, similarly, you know, Jason and uh, Amon have been translating Tao Te Ching, Art of War, and Confucius for us. 
uh, we've done about close to 100 plus meetups of that. With our Gospel of John series, we are actually going into the Greek text. We are looking at the you know, Aquinas commentary. So basically, we are used to discussing it in that way. So uh, if you want to put it in those terms, if you want me to express these things in those terms, um, I would use, I don't know, I could use Tao and I can use the most famous, my, my favorite expression of Tao, um, which actually is by Bruce Lee, which says, be like water, my friend. Or you can use something like, if you want to use the New Testament, you can say, you're trying to be 100, you know, the, the, the ideal is 100% man and 100% God. You're trying to be, be that. That's what the artistic ideal is, to have the universal principle running through you all the time. Um, that would be the way in which you would put it in that terms. Um, so, so the language, um, language part. So I, you know, that that's that's what I think. Um, I, you know, I, it's very interesting to have have this criticism, and I think you're you're very erudite, and it's it's good to have have this uh, criticism because it allows us to get a better perspective on ourselves. So thank you very much. Next up is Paul. Yeah. It's pretty amazing how we've gone to like the largest possible topic from the topic of art. I mean, it's sort of the largest possible one. And uh, often in all your meetups, Srikant, we take, I think, what you call the, the scribal method and so we don't allow it, but we intend, we say we're not allowing it. We say, we're going to look at the Gospel of John from within it, from within it, as if we're gonna embrace some ideas and see where it goes. That's your method, if I understand you, most of the time. So if we were going to look at this modern criticism, the best way I can put it, and, and Ted may be, I'm not speaking it exactly as he would say it, but he's sort of the perfect, Foil for the kind of concept of, okay, here's a theory. Um, science basically has outmoded every one of the ancient teachings that there's no such thing as the Atman, the Tao, or the soul, that that was a bunch of who, who, ha, ah, that, because people didn't know better. And if we took the book that takes that point of view and studied it in the meetups, we could have this conversation of what does science, what, what is science usable to prove and what is outside of its realm? But I don't know how we can get into that here. We don't choose to get in it. We could have gotten it in the Dow meetings, the Young meetings, the Fuller meetings, the, you know, but here we're trying to bite the biggest apple there is. So I'm just bringing that up. Thank you. I mean, the, the method that in terms of kind of selection, what we're doing is that we are choosing the classics. You know, we are basically focused on the classics. So I'm, you know, I, I have tried to bring in science and like my favorite thing would be something like, um, something like Newton's calculus. Okay, that is the place to start. The, unfortunately, most scientists, most people who talk about science have, are not scientists. They don't know what it is. They are just looking at the products of science. And they are what Leonardo calls decking themselves in works of others while not allowing others to do dignity of theirs, made actual work. So uh, if you want to do science, you know, I would recommend looking at, you know, original scientists and going, going from that. So I'm all for going back to that the 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 unfortunately the modern critics do not even i i don't think they understand the the original works of even science because like this view as you can see in the quote from from newton he has the humility he has the epistemic humility whereas everybody who is a newtonian they said everything is a billiard ball people are just billiard balls let's see what what, what how how we can knock them around so um, 
that's not something which is productive. And there is just so much of it outside that I don't, I don't think it's worthwhile spending time, you know, going through uh, the modern critics. It's just, it's just pointless. Uh, I would rather be looking at kind of adding fields like we, we basically added Seneca. Now we are adding Aristotle. Um, I want to focus on adding kind of original works of substantial health, uh, heft, which are kind of foundations of fields is what we are doing. And um, it's just partly it is imitative, right? I mean, we are trying to look at people who are operating like that, you know, who are operating at the level of Aristotle uh, above these things. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, just very quickly. Thanks for allowing me to unmute the, then maybe what I'm getting at is, let's go to the earliest work as you have with aesthetics on the philosophy of science. No. That will open this conversation. No, but the problem is that at the, unfortunately the philosophy of science is done by mostly non-scientists. <laughs> All right, oh, okay, I don't know how to approach it then, I get it. No, yeah. no, no. I'm, I'm saying it's very simple. You just go look at the early works of scientists. Look at, mm. Faraday, look at Faraday, Faraday's, you know, life of a candle is great. Um, I didn't, we didn't look at the early work of artists. We looked at Aristotle, who wasn't an artist. The philosophy of art is what we looked at. This is aesthetics, yes. This is aesthetics. And the, the point of that was to actually create a discussion like this. And in that sense, I think it has succeeded. Of, you know, just the, because that's what art is. You know, it's like he's just bringing up the simple point of imitation. We just looked at the concept of imitation. That's all we did today. And, you know, and we had all these different views. Yeah, everything is imitation. And that imitation is real. That's all you are. Or no, 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 there can be imitation of this kind. And then there is something which is more real. I mean, these are all fundamental issues of philosophy that were brought up and dealt with. So, all right. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. It was uh, wonderful. I would, uh, you know, uh, I welcome people to make any closing statements. Only one minute each, if you want. Uh, you don't have to, but if you want to make a closing statement, you're welcome to do that. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like. Uh, Tad, go ahead. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for um, re re returning on the whole we thing. I didn't realize the group had, had been going for so long, so that puts everything in context. So thank you for that. I've enjoyed the discussion very much. I feel I feel that I'm uh, on the um, that there are people who agree with me more, and there are people who agree with me less. And I think it's interesting to see the range of views and attitudes to things. I worry when language becomes very imprecise. Um, and I think um, I also worry that when we talk about creativity, if we only talk about geniuses, we're not really talking about the regular experience of creativity. And thank you all. I really enjoyed meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Evanique. Evanique, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you, Shrika. This was a great discussion. Um, I got so much out of it. Um, and I think the concept of, uh, how, I think the biggest takeaway is how do you use imitation to become your authentic self? Hmm. Or to be your authentic self, however you want to word it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, Paul, what did you think? I was just making the point in the chat. I already said my, I, I'm like left back pondering the eternal question of what can be proven with science and what cannot, which is not where I thought I'd learned to think about from this meetup. Loved every minute. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, folks. So thank you so much. And we will see you soon. Uh, I think I'm going to take a break for, um, for the Labor Day weekend. I'm traveling, but we'll see you on the other side of it. I think, um, I think Marissa is doing uh, Monday, so on on poetry. Um, so, thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Take care. Safe travels. Bye. Bye. Thanks.